پوشکین You called it a fairy tale. Yeah. Do you have is there a, do you, is there is there a fairy tale that you were inspired by? Which fairy tale is this? I I I don't know if there's one. I think it so the opening for the opening of the movie is and this will just tell you the tone. There's a voiceover throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. And the opening shot is you're pushing in on this kennel in the middle of nowhere. And it's out in a field and it's like there once was, you know, an animal named Bandit. And the bandit used to have dr- had dreams of blah 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 blah. And you're pushing in, pushing in, pushing in until you get to this pit bull sitting at the center. And it's a thing of fighting pit bulls. And he named himself Bandit because and you 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 see a flash of a little boy that the dog had seen from his kennel far far away playing with his puppy named Bandit. And Bandit had dreams of one day being that dog. And he hoped that one day someone would give him a chance and believe in him. And this this dog trainer comes, the fighting trainer, and takes Bandit out and is like, "Come on, get out of here!" And is pushing, dragging him along. And then he's like, "But that's many many years ago." And Bandit suddenly turns around and just fucking launches at his trainer and <laughs> kills the dude. And at this point in Bandit's life, all Bandit ever wanted was just revenge. You know, like just bloody revenge for the life that he's lived. I'm not remembering it verbatim. It was a long yeah. time ago. But it's like, and all he wanted was just one shot just to get payback and nothing more. And then you just push in on him and he's just got blood down his neck. Welcome to Development Hell, our miniseries about the movies that Hollywood never made. This episode is about a film starring a dog, a misunderstood dog, that the filmmaker Patty Jenkins wanted to make. You've heard of her, I'm sure. Her debut feature was Monster, an incredible portrait of Eileen Wernos, a prostitute who killed seven of her clients. Jenkins wrote and directed Monster. Charlize Theron took the lead role and went on to win the Best Actress Oscar for it. Patty Jenkins next to her to force, directing the 2017 version of Wonder Woman, The movie was a hit with critics and made more than $100 million in its opening weekend. But somewhere between those two hits, Patty Jenkins had the idea of telling a different kind of story. So um, I became aware of these dog prison programs and started to really research them and watch them and came up with this story, which is kind of a fairy tale that takes place in a dog prison program where the lead character is the dog. And my ambition was to make a rated R dog movie <laughs> where I wanted the dog to give a performance so good they discussed whether to make give it an Oscar. You know, that was my whole yeah. goal. But there was a heavy, there's a there's a serious tour de force role for, for a man. So far in Development Hell, we've only told stories about men and the movies they haven't made. This is our first story involving a woman. It's not for lack of trying. We made call after call. We recorded a truly fantastic episode with a prominent female screenwriter, and then she asked us not to run it, with good reason. Her movie never got made because she ran into a male director who didn't get the most beautiful and brilliant part of her script. And she didn't want to out him, not if she wanted to keep working as a screenwriter. And she's right. Women in Hollywood play by a very different set of rules than men. They don't have the same freedom. And more specifically, they're not allowed to tell the same kinds of stories. Which was the brick wall that Patty Jenkins ran into with her fairy tale about a misunderstood pit bull named Bandit. This is a bad dog, right? For sure. You end up realizing as the story goes by, these trainers beat the shit out of these dogs. They abuse them. And so, yeah, every once in a while, they're going to turn on and kill somebody. And that's life, you know? I Mm -hmm. obviously, having made Monster, have sympathy for why people do the things that they do and interest in why they do the things that they do. Um, But I think that's also what the core of the story is. By the end of the movie, you've seen that Bandit is, is this wonderful dog if someone had just given him a chance to prove what he's capable of doing. Patty, Patty, hold on. Back up. Dog prisons. So tell me the story. Tell me the story and tell me what a tell me what a dog prison is. So there are these programs throughout the country where they put dogs 
un- unadoptable dogs in with inmates, and they have those inmates rehabilitate the dogs. And what's an incredible thing about it is that the closer you get to to studying why and what's happening in these prison programs, you realize, and this is very much what the movie was about, that you're talking about a population of people that no one gives a second chance to. And mm-hmm. this is this will come back around to you because it's ironically, I think, related to why I could not get the movie made. Ev- everybody wants to believe that these are bad guys. They're only interested in like having them suffer and pay their dues. But the truth is that the closer you get to prison, the more you realize that prisons are mostly full of just poor people. The prisons are full of guys who have changed, never were that bad, have been in since juvie, and there's no way out. So the incredible thing about these dog programs is that they they you're looking at a population of people that nobody is interested in anything other than having them pay their dues. And then in come these animals that don't see them that way and need them to be their hero. And the men just come alive. So you're using their time to do this incredible thing. And it ends up being an absolutely stunning program where the the inmates that end up being enrolled in this have their their recidivism rate drops to almost zero. And that's what the movie was called, I Am Superman. The the guy who gets paired with this dog names him Superman. Yeah, yeah. So what is the, what's the, can you can you be more specific about the emotional journey of the actor in this? The, the emotional journey of the actor is, is the last vestige of hope that they can get out and mm. that they can have their life changed. And it's crushed when the prison shuts down the dog program and sends the dog away to be put down and, and all hell breaks loose. The journey of the actor is very much the journey that I've seen happen with many guys in prison, which is like, oh, I got tricked into thinking that I could get a GED and I could go and change my life. But the truth is, no, because even when you get out, nobody's really going to hire you. They're not going to give you a chance. They're not going to ever believe that you're different. They're only going to be interested in the tough guy that you were. And so what are you going to do? You're going to become a criminal again because it's at least there's some integrity of being a bad guy. You know, like there's no integrity of being a loser. And so it's that's his journey. And and it ends up going differently than that in the end, but only by a miracle. And so the movie was a fairy tale about a single dog. And the dog's opening scene of the movie, the dog kills its trainer. (laughs) It's like sitting on top of him with blood dripping down its mouth. It's a fighting pit bull. And he gets put in a shelter and... uh, is supposed to be put down, but this dog gets accidentally put in the program. And the inmate that gets paired with him has just been brought back into prison after being, uh, he had just paroled and he's been accused of another crime. And, but because he had had, you know, had been a good history when he was in prison before, they let him get into this program, but he hates dogs. And so it's the story of this, this terrible pit bull supposedly, and this terrible man who are paired together, who actually hate each other, who have to go through this program together. And I can't tell you the whole story because I still may make this movie Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I don't want everybody to know everything. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, it doesn't go the way you think. It's not a touchy-feely. I'm not interested in just... um, straightforward issue movies. So this is this is very much a fairy tale and the story goes slightly differently than you think it would, but but it's wonderful. Can you give us one tiny little hint of a little direction that it goes in? Yeah, the, the, you you would one would assume and will assume that it is that the man and the dog change each other. Yeah. Th- they do start to change each other, but then the entire program is sabotaged by the prison and by the administration and by the corruption, which is exactly what really is going on in these prison si- situations and things turn out very, very differently. Like a bunch of different people go a different way. Yeah. Who do we root for more by the end? The dog or the man? Both. 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 I mean, you really get to know them both and you understand, you end up understanding how misunderstood they are completely and how disinterested anybody is in what's really their story. They figure out what's up with each other, but nobody else Mm -hmm. cares or is open to it. This is... I don't, is this, this sort of, on one level, is super bleak. It's not. It's it's, it's not. magical. No, it is. It is. The journey is bleak, and it seems like it's going to be, but it ends up being magical. 
and and I love the ending and it's wonderful. But really, it's it it it. You'd like to think that you know there are these great programs and that they're changing people, and so of course we're going to continue to do them. But not only does that not happen, but then the it goes a very different way, and and that goes to the point of why I think no one ever made the movie because. The movie is all about the main character is already changed. He's already a changed guy. Um, and so it's a it really ends up being about the corruption that surrounds these guys, where even if you've changed and you've become a better person or you've mm-hmm. never really done anything, there's no way out because everybody's only interested in seeing you as the tattoos that you have and and the history. After the break, Patty and I talk more about dogs and development hell. We're back with Patty Jenkins. Are you a dog person? Big I mean, time dog person. Big Fana- time dog. Fanatical dog person. I love dogs. <laughs> How much, what, what kind of dog do you have? I have a pit bull and I have a French bulldog. Yeah. But yeah. I've had pit bulls my, my whole life. You as a, Did you grow up with d- dogs as a kid? Sort of. I mean, I, yes, I was always, my mom didn't want us to have a dog, but I was, I was always finding a way to get dogs. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I had, I had different dogs. And also my grandparents lived in Mississippi when I was young. And so I would spend every summer down there with them in Mississippi. And there were like 20, 30 pit bulls there. And this is kind of before pit bulls had this bad reputation. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up around pit bulls and I, I understand them and and know them and love them and think that they're so smart and interesting and so um so that's another thing a, an incredibly steadfast dog like uh, a, unbelievably the so um, and by the way it's not to say that there aren't some people breeding h- hyper aggressive ones I've always I've never been the person who says oh they're just like any other dog they're dangerous dogs you need to know mm-hmm. what you're dealing with if it does bite somebody it can do a lot of damage they're not very likely to bite somebody mm. and they are incredibly smart and independent and emotional dogs it's one yeah. of the most intelligent breeds yeah so how do you first of all when you conceive of a movie uh that is has in both you know whose principal characters are a person and an animal what challenges does the does the dog present huge in challenge i mean T- huge. tell me about it So this was part of what I was so excited and interested about. My goal was to get an honest performance out of a pit bull. They are incredibly emotive dogs. And so you can just read what's going on on their face. So that got me really interested in how do we do this? Not just having a trainer, you know, be over here. Really what it was going to come down to was putting the actor in a cell with the dog and actually trying to elicit that real performance out of the dog with almost no crew around. I was always, when we would talk about budget, I was saying, I want to get the tiniest crew, but I want to shoot a lot of days. And so it was just going to be slow to try to wait until you get that that right expression out of the dog and uh, elicit that actual performance from the dog. What, and so, so what are you looking for from the dog? specifically it depends it's so it's a whole you know it's a whole story so you would need the dog to dislike the guy and be hostile you'd need the dog to become curious and interested but but apprehensive and then the dog to you know f- start to fall in love with the guy you'd need the dog to all kinds of things he has to have a moment where he flips out and so um so you would need everything and that was going to be kind of the sport of it but the whole time that you're trying to elicit a natural performance from the dog, the dog is aware that there's someone with a camera. Maybe, maybe not. So if you hid enough cameras around yeah. and left, you know, like the the way that they do like reality shows where there are cameras mounted all over the car and, you know, or, or comedians in cars with coffee or like whatever. they you, you can hide different cameras. I would shoot it differently than all of my other films because everything else I've done, I've done on film. And, you know, it's a very, very big big production, this I would actually be open to shooting digitally for this very reason, just so mm-hmm. that I could get cameras everywhere. The addition, the other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to shoot it in a real prison with inmates as par- part of the crew. There are a couple of prisons that have like two different, they have a very busy prison, but they also have like a, a closed down section of the prison nearby. And so I was working on on that idea as well, where, you know, just the same way you would run a dog program, you run a very, uh, you, you know, the, the, the yard where the, the 
kind of vetted inmates are, you have them come and be trained to work as crew on the film. Mm. The problem is it, you know, it becomes a little tough if there's lockdowns and things like that. And that happens all the time. But this was all going to, you know, I was going to try to figure out how much of it I could do that way. And what about the actor? The actor would have to be on board in a in a diff. It would be a ride. It would be like a journey. You and that actor would be on a ride trying to figure out how to do this film together and try to figure out how they'd have to love dogs. They'd have to be interested in the endeavor. And um, and it would be, you know, interesting to find out how it went. You'd have to be learning the dog as you went. But it's not just have to love dogs. It's that you're also acting. So in Mm -hmm. the first part of the relationship, you have to act that you don't love dogs. Mm -hmm. So, again, that would go into camera work. When I've worked with kids before, you Mm -hmm. sometimes have moments where the actor is directing the kid off camera. I've had one where this act, this adult actress was, was Jean Triplehorn was acting out for the child what the child should do. It was wonderful because we were, we couldn't get the kid to totally do it. So, it, you know, there are many ways to get, you know, you, you might be having to do something strange to the dog to get the dog to react strangely. You're not doing your part. Oh, I see. Yeah. So before we even get to the studio, You've got to find an actor who's mm-hmm. willing to do something very unorthodox. Mm-hmm. Which wrong? I wouldn't, which I don't think would be that hard, actually, because I think it's such a juicy, like, it's such a juicy performance for an actor. It's such a good role. I had been talking to Ryan Gosling about it at the time, and this is way back. This is 2006, mm-hmm. of 2005. Um, And then Ryan and I were going to sort of do it alternately off and on, but then he kept not being able to do it or wanting to do it because he wanted to go make money or or various different things. When I would try to go to other actors, but Ryan Gosling, I would get the same sort of thing from the guys. They wanted to be tough and scary and stab somebody and whatever. And and, um, I thought that was such a telling thing that that... um, that that was a story people struggled to to embrace, a non-redemption story about prison. That was the issue I had more of. Interestingly, when I tried to make the film, even the most liberal people in Hollywood and the most issuey companies that make these films would always say, yeah, but can't he stab somebody at the beginning and be about his redemption? And I would say, no, you're very much missing the point of the movie. The, the point of the movie is that you're romanticizing prison if you think it's a bunch of super dangerous people in there. It's not. I've walked around the main line of Folsom of, you know, of the, some of the most dangerous prisons in the country. And I'm not afraid at all because 99.9% of the guys are just sad. It's just a sad sack situation. It's very organized it's just a warehouse for human beings with no way out. And that's what um, I found so fascinating about people not wanting to make it, is that no one's interested in the story about prison not being just, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's, it's uh, what's, what's fascinating about the script is you begin, I mean, the very thing that makes it hard for the studio or an actor is what makes it so intriguing for an audience because you're messing with our expectation about an animal movie. We've yeah. seen animal movies and we know how yeah. they work, right? That's why I think it's great is because yeah. the truth is a lot of people also said to me, you can't make a rated R dog movie. I was like, but everybody said you couldn't make a dog movie at all. And every time they make dog movies, they're huge. We love dogs. And so yeah. what are you talking? It's not like only kids like dog movies. Adults like dog movies. So yeah, you can definitely make a rated R dog movie. So, But it's just... Listen, I make myself feel better by saying you can't both want to do things that nobody's ever seen before and then be frustrated that nobody understands why it's going to work <laughs> or why yeah. you believe in it. But this plagues me in my whole career. Cool. I've never done anything anybody thought was going to succeed. Everybody thinks everything I do is like, oh, Wonder Woman, that's going to be terrible. Oh, Monster, that's going to be terrible. Oh, the killing is going to be a bad TV, whatever. Mm-hmm. When you finish the screenplay um, and you said, what did you say to yourself? Did you think... This is a slam dunk. Someone's going to help me make this? No, but I I knew how how very happy I was with it and the people who read it had the same reaction. You know, like people people would say, you know, that it was I've had still people some people write me and say it's still one of their favorite screenplays they've ever read. But but um I knew it was going to be a little bit hard, but I didn't 
And I still don't understand why no one would roll the dice on my very low budget second film, other than to speculate that the sexism that I was so very, very disinterested in throughout my career, but see much more clearly now, weighed into the fact that, you know, if a guy makes a, a, a Oscar winning first film, then then you roll your the dice on their second thing whereas throughout my career people have not been interested in what, or not had confidence in what I want to do they've embraced me and wanted to hire me for what they want to do but still to this day like when i have what my what the stories i want to tell are people are like ah eh, we've never seen that before and i'm like yeah but you've never seen monster before either like you want to just give it a shot so so Looking back, it took me all the way until now to be like, wait, how did nobody just say, yeah, we'll give her $5 million to make her second movie? This Different is thoughts of. This is super interesting and something I've been thinking about a lot recently, which is that you're talking about sexism here. Sexism, discrimination of any kind, takes all kinds of different forms. Yeah. And in this case, what we're talking about is someone is perfectly capable of saying you made a brilliant movie. So the... The sexism doesn't prevent them from seeing the genius of Monster. It prevents them from seeing that you could do it again. In other words, the way they make sense of Monster is, oh, it's a one-off. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think it's that, of course, it's not anybody's fault that the that the industry is based on looking backwards. So if it's something... this. This is what I think is the real gender issue. And by the way, not just gender issue, diverse stories issue in Hollywood is you can want to invite as many people behind camera and into these positions as possible. But as long as you're still basing what can and cannot succeed on the past, you're basing it on a blueprint of a very specific voice. And so I think that when I want to tell a different, like maybe a guy wouldn't think of that story that I'm coming up with, and maybe the way the emotions work are, are slightly different. Whatever it is, the combination of the fact that they haven't seen it before and also they don't like to think of women as auteurs or artists or take it as serious. Like there's a there's a romantic desire to look at guys who do like crazy art things and be like, oh, my God, they're a genius, much less so with a woman, you know. And so I think it's like the combination of those things that mm -hmm. make it tough. Mm -hmm. So what exactly... You said a little bit, but I'm curious. So you take this script out, and you want $5 million, which mm -hmm. just for those of you listening, in Hollywood terms, not a lot of money. At all. At no, all. I mean, everybody thought that Monster cost more than that. Like they, they, there was a, there was a big lawsuit about it. And one of the sides tried to say that it cost $11 million. So that's what they thought Monster cost. It actually cost 1.5, but it's, it, that was as little money as a movie can be is 5 yeah. million really. And what do you, so what, what exactly are you hearing? You're hearing a, people want, they want to, first of all, they get that they want a different perspective on the prisoner. You've said that. They 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 feel more comfortable where they have a very clear redemptive narrative when yeah. it comes to the to the Prisons. actor. But what else yeah. keep going. What else what are what what else is in their reaction? You know, I can, I can only say that it was always like no, it's like even these people saying like it's great, we love the script, but it's not for us. There's always a million different reasons. It's only as the years have gone by and my husband's always pointing it out too that we've had this so many things that I led that were my idea. Like I wanted to do an MMA show called The Fight about people in the MMA world. No, no, we don't. It doesn't make sense. Then sure enough, that goes on and becomes huge. I, it's like I, I, when I go and pitch things that I want to do and what my ideas are, so often it's been met with with like, no, but we'd love you to do this hooker with a heart of gold script or this, you know, other thing. And I'm so grateful to have been embraced to do other people's things, but there is something about it. And so, yeah, it's always something different. I don't think that they're ever even aware of it, but I do think that there's something about confidence and excitement in, in, in women's artistry that is slightly... Uh, less, on you know, they're they're less confident in. Mm -hmm. That's my well. That's my that's my point. There's a a much more constricted um, view of of your talent. It's like you this desire to see to if you can explain away a big success by saying it was like a like a, yeah. almost like a fluke. It was a it was an anomaly. Yeah. 
And you by know, the way, it's always mis. I feel it's always misunderstood as well. I remember people saying to me when I made Monster, they, one studio executive actually said to me, she came into the editing room and she actually watched uh, a part of it. And she goes, oh, sweetheart, no one wants to see a film like this. Oh, no one wants to see a movie like this. And she wrote me an email saying like, oh, you're a great kid. I know you're going to make it one day. I'm, I'm just really too bad, you know. And this is before, of course, the movie comes out and ends up, mm. you know, succeeding and making 80 something million dollars, by the way. Um, and then I would hear everybody saying like, oh, do you have any more female serial killer things? And you're like, that's the take home lesson. The take home lesson is that they want female serial killers. And the same thing I felt with Wonder Woman. I felt like Wonder Woman was there was just so much emphasis on gender where it was like, oh, everybody wants to see a woman directing a woman's story. I'm like, is that it? It's not because of the movie. It's not the hero's journey. It's not, you know, it's like, and then there are a hundred women get women action things made on the, it's like, it's always, it's the wrong lesson. And, and but, mm -hmm. but I think in the, there's so much focus on the woman part of it versus being like, oh, it's a good film and, and it's an unorthodox film, but they pulled it off. Instead, it's just like, oh, female serial killers. That's it. That's what everybody wanted. At, at what point do you think it would change? Like, give me a hypothetical. What would I have to happen in your career for people to say, you want to do it? Given your track record, let's go for it. I, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know. Too many of the women I know who have had major successes are also, we all behind closed doors whisper about how it, it sort of doesn't change. I think the world is a really, really long way away from that. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. I think it's, you know, I may find my own financing and have my own people and get my own movies made. But I, I think that the world is still genuinely run way behind closed doors by 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 the same people who ha who have a desire for the interests that they have and no matter who they're putting on the lower levels the mandate is still bumping up to that level and the truth is like we're real far from from really diverse voices being understood and and embraced and it's not about money either so that that's the unfortunate thing I'll be right back with more from Patty Jenkins While Patty was telling me about her dog prison fairy tale, I kept thinking about what the story shares with Monster. How upbringing and events can conspire to wound people, or dogs, and shape what we expect from them. Monster and I Am Superman are both stories that ask us to look for nuance in some very dark places. Jenkins, I was thinking, seems compelled by these kinds of dark places. So I asked her about it. We're... Where does this come from in you? This... So it's funny because I think we both have very uh, backgrounds of of a lot of exposure and travel. And I think that that's, I, you know, when I was little, we moved to Viet to Thailand and during the Vietnam War. And then we moved to... Um, You're an Air Force brat. Are you an Air Force Air brat? Air Force brat, yeah. yeah. And I think I grew up consciously or unconsciously in the shadow of the Vietnam War in... Thailand, you know, with my father's people dying right and left and the plant, you know, everything that's really going on. So I think I was I was born into uh, the around the darkness mm -hmm. in, in a familiar way. And then my own father passed away in a plane crash and, you know, all these things. And I lived all over the place. So then I've always never quite been one type of person. I'm not like from somewhere and like of a type. And so I've always been curious in all types of people and what's going on with you. And I'm not daunted by the darkness. And as a result, I ended up making friends with all kinds of people my whole life. Like I've been friends with definitely people who have done some terrible things and ended up in prison. And as as much as I've been friends with, you know, upper class socialites or whatever. I've known all kinds of people, but I I think that the people who uh, end up living some of the most dangerous lives, have I have a real soft spot for because I've watched 
them turn into those people and seeing how how misunderstood they are and um and how easy it would be to have to happen to anybody should they were they the ones that went through that journey so it's just i it's not my only as you can see like wonder woman is also my interest you know Mm -hmm. like i have arrested development is also my interest i have lots and lots of interests i think the reason i like such diverse work myself is because because of what i just said i'm not one type of person i've had to learn how to live in different circumstances at different times but but this issue, these issues definitely are near and dear to my heart. And also, I think the most misunderstood because people have so little access to to understanding these stories. Yeah. How old were you when your dad died? Seven. Oh, wow. I always think about, you know, in one, I've, in one of my books, I had a whole section on what the, uh, and it, this all this work on what happens to people when they lose a, parent at a young age and it's this incredible study that was done in England of um, an extraordinarily high percentage of high achieving people lost a parent in youth um, mm. and it, wow. the, the argument is that it it has one of two effects it you know it's like you know it's the Nietzschean thing it either crushes you or it makes you stronger you've gone through just about the most horrendous thing that can happen to a child. And if you can emerge from the other side of that, you're kind of um toughened in some way. I'm just I'm I'm just Hugely. fascinated by your by how drawn you are to um investigating this kind of darkness and mm-hmm. finding some some value in it. Mm-hmm. I think that that's or some understanding. Well is a said. Word. It's uh, well I'm said. Just, understanding I is think a word. it was it's interesting to look back on this and how, first of all, it was the definitive event in my life was my father dying. It was, had a huge, huge influence on everything after, particularly in my youth. I think it was funny in watching Anatomy of a Fall this last year, what I thought was so interesting that and, and illuminating to me was how condescending everyone is to the child about their understanding of what's going on. And that really rang true to me where I think that a lot of people, even at our age, don't necessarily know how bad bad can be. Like, they just don't know. They haven't been close to it, to the worst possible thing that could ever happen to you happening. And when it happens to you as a child, you're obsessed with your parents at seven years old. You are in love with them. And my father was like such a heroic figure, like taking off on his motorcycle every day and then flying off in his F4. You know, it's like he was like a superhero in my life. So to t- so so to have that happen and then tell me you'll never see him again like it's it was such exquisite revealing of how bad the world can be it obl- and and now when I look back I'm like oh yeah people are saying to you like oh every cloud has a silver lining and all these things and you're like I I want to die like you're done it's you're suicidal really your your interest in this place is over and I only now realize that looking back I'm like oh. All of these words and how I was probably being viewed as a seven-year-old is she'll forget him, she'll get over him, she'll win. And you're like, dude, I can't, I I don't want to be here where that can happen at any moment. I don't trust any of this now. And so I think that it's it's a very interesting thing that you do have to kind of toughen yourself and learn how to exist in that world where you know that that can and i still really struggle with it i really struggle with it as it relates to my child where struggle i'm like with I, it, what's what's it with the knowing what how bad bad can be oh i see yeah like knowing that that we all feel like it's not going to be us and it can't really happen but it really could you know and it could happen at any moment and there's nothing you can do about it you know um interestingly i don't think i would be the director i am if my father hadn't died and then I think Monster I made literally directly about the death of my father. It was about like, oh, okay, cool. Everything works out. Everything happens. Like the voiceover in that movie is saying everything, you know, it's all these myths that she's heard throughout her youth. If you just, you know, if you just love and believe in yourself, anything can happen. Nope, not for Eileen Warnes, you know. So that it was a direct uh, a chance for me to express how dark the world can be that people might not realize. And I think the driven part, What's interesting? I don't. I'd have to think about what I think it is that makes you driven. For me, I was, 
I was passionate to take control of the narrative. And my original reason for wanting to be a filmmaker was that I thought that the stories were always going to be terrible in real life. So I was like, so I want to tell my story. I want to be the one who controls the story so at least I can live a good outcome there, you know? And I turned out to be pleasantly wrong that, you know, I've lived a wonderful knock on wood life in, in so many ways. Um, but yeah, I think it was like, it, it made me very, very driven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you, now you want to take uh, this story back out and try and do Maybe. it again. Maybe. I haven't decided. I haven't decided. Tell me how you would, knowing what you know, by the way, what you just said is is incredibly. Um, uh, it's sort of it's it it's it's move. I mean, it's really move. I mean, it's incredibly kind of moving, um, mm. and um, and honest Thank about you. why you do what you do. Um, what's in What's interesting is that what is for most of us, you know, I've had a when I was. Growing up as a kid, I, I, you know, thought all the time about what it would mean if I lost one of my parents. But it was an abstract thought. For you, it's real. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. So I can't, as a kid, when I thought about that, it wasn't something I could put into words. It wasn't something I could make real to anyone else. It was just a kind of, it's the kind of weird kind of fantasy you have, dark fantasy you have at three in the morning. You're like, oh my God, mm -hmm. what would happen if... But you act by virtue of gone going through it. You you knew what it felt like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, because after my father died, then my sister had a like the most beautiful friend runaway boy who came and lived with us, and I was like so in love with him. He was like three years older than us, Paul Panzini. He was like beautiful, and you know, and um, he'd run away and was living in our house, and then he had to go visit a cousin, and he got shot in the head. And killed. Oh and so I was, between those two things, I was like, this place sucks. <laughs> I, you know, was, it made me very romantic, though. Like, I, you, you, interestingly, that kind of tragedy, I think, particularly for the opposite sex parent and then the opposite sex older brother figure, it made me so romantic about everything, but about, like, love and longing and loss. Mm -hmm. I think it's... Like, I, t I take for granted my familiarity with the darkness, but of course the romance of the stories I want to tell are very much born from that. And so um, I think I sort of thought I was this much darker, rebellious, mm -hmm. the type of person that makes monster in my youth. And now I realize I'm not that person. I'm also the person that makes Wonder Woman. I'm all kinds of, you know, like I've grown up. I'm not just that person. But so I think that makes me look back and say, yeah, why do I have that much darkness? Oh, that's interesting. Let's look back. You you really don't you just you just go forward for a long, long time before you say, like, how do I explain to people that I made Monster and I made Wonder Woman? You know, mm -hmm. wait. So. Um, if you were to take this movie back out, mm -hmm. knowing what you know, both about your the first round of attempts with it and about yourself. How would you pitch it differently? I don't think I would pitch it, you first wouldn't. of all. You I don't think I it. would. I think I would try to stack it up with my own financing and control because I think I, I made, I've, I've made my peace with the fact that it, it might not be the easiest thing to trust. And so I, I, you kind of need to be left alone to make it. I, I maybe would take it to one or two places, but I don't think I would go out, you know, with my hands out, hoping that Hollywood understands this film now. I'm playing the game in a more in a more sophisticated way now mm -hmm. with age and with experience where you're sort of like, oh, I see what this is and I see how it could go wrong. And just to give this film a winning hand, I'd need the 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 space to actually make it what it could be, not be fielding a bunch of notes from a bunch of people who are afraid, who need it to, you know, who who to, could, that they've never seen a film like this before. So mm. I th I think, um, yeah, it's more just about how to set yourself up to succeed. I want to see this movie. Will you? Will you? <laughs> Maybe will you, you will. Will you promise Maybe you will. us that you'll? If if I don't make it, I'll come back and okay. tell you the rest okay. of the story. <laughs> this has been fantastic. This episode was produced by Nina Bird Lawrence, 
with Tali Emlin and Ben Nadaf Haffrey. Editing by Sarah Nix. Original scoring by Luis Guerra. Engineering by Echo Mountain. Our executive producer is Jacob Smith. I'm Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs>